I started this message about a month ago, I think. I think I'm on finish this morning. Um, Acts 6.33. And with great power have the, have the apostles, or gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Let me just, uh, if you have your outline from this, mor- from this morning's bulletin, the blanks have been filled in that I've covered, which is most of them. But the church does have a great purpose. Their purpose was to obey the Savior, to obtain the promise, and offer the gospel. The church has great preaching. The, uh, uh, and, and, and I, think, I think it's good for, for maybe me to clarify what great preaching is. Now, I've never claimed to be a great preacher, and, uh, but I, I, I do claim to do great preaching because it does exalt the Savior, it edifies the saints, and it exposes sin. And I do try to do that in the process of preaching. The church has great power. <clears throat> it depends upon a clean life. Remember, God will not fill a dirty vessel with his Holy Spirit power. It depends on consistent walking. It depends upon continual asking. And then I use the illustration of David and how David had a willing heart, a wise head, and working hands. Then also... The church has great persecution. I don't know why it is that when when, uh, uh, when, when we get an, an affliction or uh, get mistreated in some way or uh, something goes awry, we, we feel sorry for ourselves. When Jesus said that if you follow me, you will be persecuted. And uh, so... Why should it be unexpected or why should it be a surprise when it actually happens? When the Lord told us we need, we might as well expect it because it is going to happen. The church also has great people. I'd rather, I'd rather be with church people than any other people in the world. Of course, I've not been around very many other people, but, uh, but, uh, uh, I've played, uh, uh, softball and and uh, little basketball but not much and uh, I, I play golf and, and with non-church people and and I can say without any reservation I'd rather be among church people because there's a common bond between us the Lord says that he will put uh, uh, unity between your spirit and my spirit that we are ch- children of God. And uh, uh, I'm just not as comfortable with non-Christian or non-church people because I don't have anything in common with them except the fact that Jesus loves them just as he loves me. So anyway, the church has great people, the church has great praise, and the church has great promises. And that's where we began this morning. We have the promise of heaven. My mind was uh, going a little bit this morning during the singing, and, and uh, when I thought about heaven, I thought about the preacher who was preaching about heaven, and uh, he said, everybody who wants to go to heaven, stand up. Well, everybody stood up except the little boy on the front. And the preacher said, well, son, don't you want to go to heaven when you die? He said, oh, yeah, I do when I die, but I thought you were getting a load together right now. So, uh, uh, so, but you know, that's the way we all are. We all want to go to heaven when we die, but nobody's in a hurry to get there. Uh, we, we'll do everything in our power to hold on to life as we know it. But where is heaven? Well, I think according to Scripture, there are actually two heavens. <clears throat> and I hope that I get you to thinking a little bit this morning. The first heaven is the heaven to which we go when we die now. 
which I will call the intermediate heaven. That's where my parents are, my grandparents, those that I knew are. Uh, that's where uh, I have two sisters in heaven. Uh, that's where we go when we die now. Then there's the eternal heaven that John saw coming down from God out of heaven, and that's here on this earth. And the earth will be purged, it will be renewed, it will be restored, but I'll get into, get into that in a moment. Uh, so many times we get the wrong idea about heaven. Uh, we think heaven is... Uh, well, a place where we go to church all the time. And I don't know that I'd like that all the time. We, 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 we have the idea that heaven is going to be a boring place. And by the way, that is a work of the devil. Remember, he was kicked out of heaven and became bitter toward God and also toward mankind and toward heaven itself. And so the place that was no longer his, he doesn't want us to look forward to either. It must be maddening for him that, that we are now entitled to the home that he was kicked out of. What better way for the devil and his demons to attack us than to whisper lies about the very place on which God tells us to set our hearts and our minds. Now, Satan doesn't need to convince us that heaven does not exist. He only needs to convince us that heaven is a boring place. If we believe that lie, we will be robbed of our joy and anticipation. We will set our minds on this life and not the next one. Besides that, we won't be motivated to share our faith. Why would we try to get somebody else to go where we're not anxious to go ourselves? Well, like I said, there's an intermediate heaven and there is an eternal heaven. The intermediate heaven is where I would go if I were to drop dead in the pulpit right now. Uh, a transitional period between this present life and the eternal life or the, the eternal heaven. I didn't mean eternal life because... I have eternal life now. Even though I'm, uh, I'm, I'm still living in this fleshly body, I, I have eternal life now. But uh, by eternal heaven, I'm talking about uh, that, that once and for all heaven where there will be no more transitional periods. Usually when we refer to heaven, we mean the place to which Christians go when they die. When we talk about our loved ones being in heaven, we're referring to the present or the intermediate heaven. And by definition, an intermediate heaven is a, well, it, it, the very name implies it's temporary. The uh, life in the heaven we go to when we die is not really our final destination. Because really, we have not stood at the judgment seat of Christ yet. We have not been with God at the great white throne judgment yet. We have not received the rewards done in this body yet. Now, you may say, well, does that mean we're just disembodied spirits in heaven? No. I have no idea what kind of body I will have. It would probably be a temporary uh, body that the Lord gives me, but nowhere in Scripture does it imply that we will be disembodied spirits in heaven. 
And by the way, we won't be angels either. Uh, we won't be devils either. We wouldn't be in heaven. But, uh, but, but uh, God created all the angels that he'll ever need. And so he doesn't need any more. And just because we have a little loved one that dies doesn't mean that he or she is going to be translated into to being an angel when they get to heaven. Um, but I, I, like I said, I, I don't know what kind of body the Lord's going to give me, but, but I think it looked enough like me to where people will recognize me. Um, so where is the eternal heaven? If, if, if the present heaven, if the intermediate heaven is in the heavenlies where our loved ones are and where God is, then where is the eternal heaven? Well, like I said, it's like John saw in the book of Revelation. He saw once this earth was restored, he saw the new heaven, the new earth coming down from God out of heaven. Now, I don't think it hovers between heaven and earth. I think it comes to earth and uh, because of the, what, the teachings of the Bible. God has never given up on his original creation. God never wipes his hands clean of anything he ever did and did it well. And whatever he does, he does well. Remember, Jesus came to restore to us what we lost in the first Adam. That's why he's called the second Adam. The eternal heaven will be a restored Eden. We often overlook an entire biblical vocabulary that makes that point clear. Words like reconcile, redeem, restore, recover, return, renew, regenerate. Resurrect, each of these biblical words began with the R-E prefix, suggesting a return to the original condition that was ruined or lost. For example, redemption means to buy back what was formerly owned. That's why on the cross of Calvary, Jesus gave his blood to redeem us from the curse of the law and, the sin, and sin. That we once belonged to him, but then we sold out to the devil. And Jesus died on the cross to redeem us, to buy us back. That's what redemption is. Reconciliation means the restoration of or reestablishment of a prior friendship or unity. Remember how God came walking through the garden in the cool of the day and had a conversation with Adam? Once sin entered, that relationship was lost. But Jesus died on the cross so that we might be reconciled to God that we might return to that former friendship, that former unity, that former relationship we had with the Lord Jesus Christ. Renewal means to make new again, restoring to an original state. Adam and Eve were created perfect. But they were created with a free will. And so they could choose to disobey God and obey the devil if they wanted to, which they did. And once they did, the whole human race was plunged into sin and degradation. But Jesus died on the cross so that we might be renewed. 
and resurrection means becoming physically alive again after death. So these words emphasize that that God always sees us in the light of what he intended us to be. I think so often of Peter and how Jesus called him and said, from now on, you're, you're going to be rock. And I can see Peter's friends kind of snickering under their breath, thinking, Jesus, he doesn't know who he's talking about. Because if there's any one of the 12 disciples that would not have been named Rock, it was Peter. But Jesus named him Rock because he saw who he would become. Not who he was when he called him, but who he would be when the Holy Spirit had come upon him and indwelt him and empowered him for service. He said, Peter, you're going to be a rock that will stand on the day of Pentecost and preach, and 3,000 will get saved. He always seeks to restore us to that original design. And in the same way, he sees the earth in terms of what he intended it to be. And he seeks to restore it to its original design. So what will be in the restored Eden? Well, Adam and Eve were there. And they were in physical bodies. If the Lord does not intend for us to be in physical bodies, what good is the resurrection? Because our bodies, even though it's the, the many of them it will be dust and ashes, they will be resurrected, and body and soul be reunited to stand before God and live with him forever. I mean, those who are believers. So Adam and Eve were, and Jesus was in a physical body after his resurrection. So there will be the restoration to hell. The restoration to life, restoration to freedom from demonic possession and oppression. In fact, Jesus' miracles give us an example or a sample of the meaning of redemption, of freeing, of creation from the shackles of sin and evil, and a reinstatement of creaturely living as intended by God. God determined from the beginning that he would redeem mankind and and restore the earth. Let's not underestimate God. I know many of us try to make God in our own image. Folks, it's totally impossible. It cannot be done. But there are those who say, well, I know this is what God says, but here's what I think. Who cares what I think? Who cares what you think? It's what God says that's the bottom line. So his original plan will be fulfilled, whether we like it or not. He's going to do what he intends to do. And so we might as well get, get in with the program. Now, Christ's resurrected life is a model for ours. Not only do we know what our present bodies are like, but we also have an example in Scripture of what a resurrection body is like. Remember the time when after the resurrection he said, touch me. Spirit does not have flesh and bones. I have both. Yet, he was able to go through the wall 
when the disciples were gathered together on the evening of the resurrection and he just appeared to them. I don't understand that. I don't know how it's done. <laughs> I wouldn't dare try it. 1 John 3, 2. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And so we will have bodies like his resurrection body throughout eternity. Also in Luke 24, 39, Jesus said, Behold my hands and my feet, that is I myself. Handle me and see, for his spirit hath not flesh and bones as ye see me have. So that eliminates the theory that we will be disembodied spirits floating around in heaven throughout eternity. Christ's resurrected body was suited for life on earth, not primarily life in the intermediate heaven, even though Jesus is there now. As Jesus was raised to come back to live on earth, so we will be raised to come back to live on earth as it is the eternal heaven. 1 Thessalonians 4.14 For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Revelation 21, 1-3 And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. In Luke 24, we read also where Jesus walked with two disciples on the road to Emmaus. They asked him questions. He taught them and guided them in their understanding of Scripture. They saw nothing different enough enough about him to call attention to himself. In fact, they didn't recognize him until their eyes were opened. And this suggests that God had prevented them from recognizing Jesus earlier, which they otherwise would have immediately. The point is, they didn't see anything different about him once their eyes were open. We know the resurrected Christ looked like a man because G, uh, Mary called him Sir when she assumed he was the gardener in John twenty fifteen. Though at first she didn't recognize his voice, when he called her by name, she recognized him. Now, it's easy for me to, (coughs) excuse me, (coughs) it's easy for me to understand why Mary didn't recognize him, because it was not customary for a single woman to look a male stranger in the eye. And so she probably didn't even look up at his, at his face until she recognized his voice. And then she immediately look, uh, looked up and recognized him. Also, Jesus stood on the shore at a distance from his disciples early one morning. He didn't float or hover, but he was there in body. In body. He stood and called to his disciples in an audible voice. And obviously, his voice sounded human because they they weren't startled except the fact that he was there. 
And the disciples did not suspect that it was any one but a human. Jesus had started a fire and he was cooking fish. Now he could have snapped his finger and said, hey, cook fish up here. But he didn't do that. He acted just like you and I would in a similar situation. And when they came ashore, he added some of their fish to his fish and said, come, let's enjoy breakfast. We also learn from Jesus about resurrected relationships. Christ communicates with his disciples and shows his love for them as a group and as individuals. He instructs them and entrusts a task to them. In Acts 1, 4 through 8, they were to wait for the promise of the Father. What was the promise? The gift of the Holy Spirit. And he said, after, but ye shall receive power, after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Also, well, I mentioned the interaction he had with Mary outside the tomb. Also, I think it's interesting uh, the reaction from Thomas when the disciples came to them after came to him after Jesus appeared to them, and they said, "Hey, we saw the Lord. The Lord <clears throat> appeared to us." Thomas said, "I don't believe it until I can." feel the nail prints in his hands and thrust my hand in his side, I won't believe he's alive. Eight days later, he appeared to them again, and this time Thomas was with them. And Jesus said, come here, Thomas. You and I have something to settle. It's remarkable. Thomas didn't need to do that. He said, my Lord and my God. Once he had seen him, that was enough. Notice Jesus said, Reach hither thy finger and behold my hands, and reach hither my hand and thrust it, thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. And there was a time after they had eaten a meal, Jesus said to Peter, Peter, do you love me? Peter said, yeah, Lord, you know everything. You know I love you. Jesus said, Peter, do you love me? You got to understand that in the Greek language, which Jesus was using, there are different words for love. There is a word for friendship. There's a word for, uh, I think, a little closer friendship. Then there's the agape kind of love the kind that God has for us. And Peter said, Lord, you know, you know I love you. And then Peter, then Jesus said, Peter, do you agape me? Do you love me with a godly kind of love? Peter was grieved. He was heartbroken. And he said, Lord, You know all things. You know I love you. I agape you. I know there's some speculation as to why Jesus asked three times. I don't know if it's because Peter denied the Lord three times or I don't really know why. I don't think it's important or the Bible would have told us why. But at least he took Peter progressively from being a friendly kind of love to an agape kind of love. What if he were to ask you this morning, do you agape me? Do you love me with a godly kind of love? What would your answer be? Well, after the first time, Jesus told him to feed his lambs, and he said, feed my sheep. And then the third time, he told him again, feed my sheep. 
his interactions with these same people were very similar to the kind of interactions he had had with them before he died and before he was resurrected, which leads me to believe that death is nothing more than a transition. We won't lose friendships. We won't lose relationships. Except those who do not know the Lord, then they're not going to be with us in heaven, but, but all believers will be with us. The fact that Jesus picked up his relationships where he left off is a foretaste of our own lives after we are resurrected. We will experience continuity between our current lives and our eternal lives, our resurrected lives. Then the question arises, will we know one another in heaven? Well, I've always maintained that I won't be any dumber in heaven than I am now. So yes, I'll know you in heaven if you're there. And I'm fairly confident you will be. As I hope you're fairly confident that I will be. God originally designed us to need each other. Folks, I need you. I mean, I don't just need you to have someone to preach to. I need you to have someone to lean on. I, uh, I miss you when you're not here. You might say, well, my, you know, nobody's going to miss me. I miss you. <laughs> when was it? One April Fool's Day here a while back. It came on a Sunday and everybody switched seats. Threw me for a loop. You know, when I stand up here, I, I never turn around and look, see who's here, who's not, till I get up here behind the pulpit. And I looked, and, and, and I think, I always call them the farmer girls because that was their maiden names. They, they were sitting over here, and everybody, nobody was in their, in their right seat. I was tempted to have everybody move back to where they, where they should be before I could preach that morning, but, but I finally struggled through it. But it's amazing how, you know, uh, when you're not here, I, I think back and I think, now their seat was empty. So uh, I miss you when you're not here. Eden was the forerunner of the new earth, the eternal heaven. Since meaningful human companionship turned God's assessment of not good into a declaration of very good on the first earth, we shouldn't expect him to change his mind on the new earth. Jonathan Edwards saw no conflict between anticipating our relationship with God and our loved ones. He said, and I quote, Every Christian friend that goes before us from this world is a ransom spirit waiting to welcome us in heaven. There will be the infinite days that we have lost below through grace to be found above. There were there the Christian father, the mother, the wife, and child, and friend with whom we shall renew the holy fellowship of the saints, which was interrupted by death here, but shall be commenced again in the upper sanctuary, and then shall never end. There we shall have companionship with the patriarchs and fathers and saints of the Old and New Testaments, and those of whom the world was not worthy. And there above all, we shall enjoy and dwell with God the Father, whom we have loved with all of our hearts on earth, 
and with Jesus Christ, our beloved Savior, who has always been to us the chief among ten thousands and altogether lovely, and with the Holy Spirit, our sanctifier and guide and comforter, and shall be filled with all the fullness of the Godhead forever. End of quote. Another question I think of quite often is, will there be, will there be a reunion in heaven? I think there will be. And I don't know how, but I think my mother is going to bake homemade rolls for everybody. I've often mentioned how we'd have church suppers at church in Illinois, and mother would bake homemade rolls for everybody and bring them and bake them in the oven at church so they'd be fresh and hot. And I'm talking about the old-fashioned yeast kind of rolls. I don't know why I always think about those things at lunchtime. <laughs> Paul anticipates his ongoing relationship with the Thessalonians as part of his heavenly reward. And let me read to you 1 Thessalonians 2, 19 and 20. What is our hope, our joy, or the crown in which we will glory in the presence of the Lord Jesus when he comes. Is it not you? Indeed, you are our glory and joy. I've often thought, when I get to heaven, I'm going to be able to renew acquaintance with all the church members I've ever had over and over 57 years in pastoral ministry. From Illinois to Flat River, Missouri, to Phoenix, Arizona, back to Illinois, and even here in Michigan. So I believe there will be a reunion. My sons will always be my sons. My grandchildren will always be my grandchildren. My parents will always be my parents. My brothers and sisters will always be my brothers and sisters. Now, I'm not sure what the relationship will be because right now, even though I have one living brother and two living sisters, two sisters have gone on to be with the Lord. They're in the, the, in the intermediate heaven now. But I have a brother that lives in, in uh, Arnold, Missouri. I have a sister that lives in Nashville, Tennessee. I have a, list, a sister that lives in Vancouver, Washington, we very seldom see one another. So my relationship with you is really closer than my relationship with them. Oh, we communicate some by email and once in a while a phone call, but, but uh, very, very seldom see one another unless it's a funeral or something like that, you know. But... Uh, But they will always be my brother and sisters. Resurrected body presumably will have chromosomes and DNA with a signature that forever testifies to our genetic connection with family. Now, like I said, I'm not sure what my relationship with my brothers and sisters will be, but, but, but I do know that we will be one big family in heaven. Now, what about marriage? Well, the Bible says there will be no marriage in heaven. However, the Sadducees were always trying to trick Jesus into saying something with which they could condemn him. Remember, they didn't believe in the resurrection of the dead. So attempting to try to make him look foolish, they told Jesus of a woman who had seven husbands who had all died, and they asked him, now then at the resurrection, whose wife shall she be of the seven since all of them were married to her. Christ replied, at, at the resurrection, 
people will neither marry nor be given in marriage. They will be like the angels in heaven. Now, the Bible does not teach there will be no marriage in heaven. In fact, it makes it clear there will be marriage in heaven. What it says is there will be one marriage in heaven between Christ and his bride. And I will be a part of that. Paul links human marriage to the higher reality it mirrors in Ephesians 5, 31 and 32. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. The one flesh marital union we know on earth is a signpost pointing to our relationship with Christ as our bridegroom. And once we, we reach the destination, the signpost becomes unnecessary. I noticed when we went to Charlotte, North Carolina, I set our GPS for each stop along the way. And I noticed that it would give detailed descriptions on where to turn, began in two miles before each turn, and then a dinging when I had reached my turn point. But I noticed once I reached the destination, it said, you have reached your destination, and all directions went off. So when we get to heaven, and we become married to the bride or the bridegroom. We'll not need any more GPSs or any signposts because we will have reached our destination. Now, my wife Jane is my closest friend and also my closest sister in Christ. Will we become more distant in the new world? No, we will become better friends than we've ever been before. The God who said it is not good for the man to be alone is the giver and blesser of our relationships. And although Jane has been a wonderful wife, in the eternal heaven, we will both be married to the most wonderful person who has ever lived in this universe. He is already the one we love the most. There is no competition. On earth, the closer we draw to him. You know, I've used the analogy before about God, me, Jane. The closer we get to God, the closer we grow to each other. Now, if one of us were to grow closer to the Lord than the other, then we would get farther apart. So it only makes sense that we both jointly get closer and closer to the Lord Jesus. What about our children? Well, I have every reason to believe we'll pick up in heaven right where our relationship leaves off here on earth. Oh, we'll gain many new ones but we'll continue to deepen the old ones. I think we'll especially enjoy connecting with those we have faced tough times with here on earth. We'll say things like, did you ever imagine heaven would be so wonderful? Folks, it will not be boring. I've tried, the other day, I was sitting out on our deck eating, having breakfast, and, and uh, we have just an open field behind us, and, and then there's some trees and woods and so on. And I thought to myself, God, you made all of this just 
for our enjoyment. How you must have loved us. Not only this, but you gave your son to die on the cross to redeem us. I marvel at his love. And to think one day, I'll see him face to face. Not only that, but I will be like him. I enjoy living on this earth. I enjoy activities. I enjoy sports. And I would enjoy just living here forever and ever without sin. And to me, that's what the eternal heaven is going to be like. Some of you will get up every morning. Some of us will get up every morning and, and, and serve the king doing what we enjoy doing. Others of you will get up every afternoon and serve the king, enjoy doing what you enjoy doing. Now, in hell, it won't be that way. I plan to get to that sometime in September, but uh, uh, let, me, let me just mention in closing that, that in hell, it's a place of outer darkness. No friendships. No love. You will never hear a baby cry or laugh. In fact, the Bible says it's a bottomless pit. That means there will never be a place. Once you die, there will never be a place upon which you may plant your feet. Falling, tumbling, forever and ever in a place of outer darkness. You cannot see your hand in front of your face. Because you've rejected God's Son, who gave himself so that you might be saved. <clears throat> we do have other blanks to fill in, so let me give those to you, and then I'm going to I think he's preached about three messages on the Holy Spirit, so let me, I'm not going to dwell on these at all. We have the promise of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a person, not an impersonal force. The Holy Spirit is God, not a creation of God. And then also we have the promise of genuine happiness. Do you know for sure that if you were to die before you left this building, you would go to heaven? You can know. The Bible says, he that hath the Son hath life. So if the Lord Jesus Christ lives in your life, then you have eternal life. If he doesn't, you have eternal death. But you can have eternal life this morning if you'll trust Christ as your personal Savior and Lord.